Yo, my peoples, what's up? My name is Jason. Thank you so, so much for joining me for another Dice Tower Review. Today, I am talking about Goonies, Never Say Die. This one is from Prospero Hall, the design studio published by Funko Games. It is a one versus many, a dungeon delving style adventure with the IP of the Goonies. If you remember that movie from the 80s, uh, there is so much flavor wrapped into this one uh, in terms of being the heroes, uh, young kids that are searching for gold and going down and delving into uh, different areas, different scenarios. Uh, this game goes off the movie, certainly, but then branches off into all sorts of adventure, really deepens the lore of Goonies. Uh, you'd be playing as one of the Goonies if you're playing the many, or you'd be playing the Goondocks Master, which is kind of an opponent for each of the individual heroes, uh, and you'd be doing that over nine different scenarios, or possible scenarios for you. Let me go ahead and show you how it works, and I'll tell you what I think. So without further ado, let's go to the videotape. So where we start with explaining the game Goonies Never Say Die is, of course, with the Goonies. So then I have a two-player game laid out or a two-player, uh, three-player game, two players and a GM. Uh, but this game, uh, I have Data and Chunk as a potential prep. I also have options for Mouth and Sloth and Mikey. Uh, they all have different abilities. Uh, depending on how you want to go about it. Some characters are fairly easy, like Chunk is a pretty straightforward character. Data has all sorts of gadgets. If you remember the original movie, you have the uh, boxing glove that comes out of his trench coat, the chattering teeth, and all sorts of gadgets. Uh, but most of the characters are fairly simple. You also have the teenagers. Uh, they are represented by cards on the side. Uh, they will help you along the way as one-shot abilities. If you wanted to play the teenagers as characters, you'd have to get the expansion. So go ahead and look out for that one. After setup, uh, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to choose the adventure. This is an adventure book and it has nine different scenarios. You can play each scenario as a standalone or you can play them in sequence as a campaign. The first couple of adventures are very much directly evoke the movie, but then it goes off. <laughs> it is still very Goonie-ish, but there is definitely some uh, deepening of the lore that happens. So there are going to be surprises for folks who are familiar with the Goonies lore and have always wanted to dig in a little bit further. So I'm going to show you a little bit of the book because this is going to be a secret to the players. Uh, the GM will look at Adventure 1, the Lighthouse, uh, Lighthouse Lounge. They are going to know the map, but they are going to set up uh, the start area and also read the introduction, which I have done here. This is the starting area, and there are a couple of things in here and also a passage into an unexplored area. This is a dungeon exploration game where you're going to be taking actions and discovering rooms, opening up the map, very old school <laughs> D&D-like. On your turn, each Goonie is going to take two actions. Turn order doesn't really matter. It just depends on which Goonie feels like going, uh, what is advantageous for the scenario. But let's say I wanted to go with Data. There is the Data Mini right there. Look at that, adorable. <laughs> I have a couple of options, a uh, simple option I could move. But before then, uh, there are going to be lots of these kind of tokens. I wouldn't be Goonies without lots and lots of searching. Uh, so then you would look on your character placard and then you would look for the relevant skill. So if I wanted to search, I would roll dice. These are custom dice. There are six-sided, eight-sided, and 12-sided. And they are representing different levels of uh, success. So you can have one bones or two bones or no bones. That'd be terrible. <laughs> I'll get to the skull in a second. But obviously, the more sides that a die has, the more chance you have for success. So since Data is fairly good at searching, he is going to roll the two bones. He is going to get a success. A success, uh, you search the pile, uh, and then you draw from an item deck. These are very, very simple items. If you get two or more successes on any of the things that you search, and you're gonna find a few of these, you are going to be able to draw from the advanced deck, so this is a little bit more powerful. So you always find stuff. <laughs> it wouldn't be an adventure if you didn't find lots of stuff, right? All right, so aside from searching, we're going to go ahead and move. We can move to any unexplored area. The GM has total control over what gets revealed. So uh, if the characters are in a certain room, they all, the GM kind of 
uh, puts the players or points the players in the right way by putting out down these explore tokens so that they can open up the map that only the GM has access to. So then we're going to move and then the GM is going to consult the book and ah, a bet. <laughs> And that comes out of the book. And then the players would have to decide what they're going to do with that. So then Chunk is going to come in. He sees that. And he is uh, loaded for bear. He's ready to fight. So then Chunk has a little bit more advanced strength. Uh, but uh, not only can he use his strength to attack, these wish tokens are available so that you can upgrade your dice. So then you would spend your wish token. And in Chunk's case, he is able to... Uh, spend a wish token to upgrade two dice instead so then he is going to roll two of the best dice against the creature and he is going to roll one damage and a skull Whew, what a terrible roll that is he's going to do damage uh and then the skull whenever the skull is rolled the gm laughs with glee please laugh you're a gm you get these skull tokens and they will be useful for the gm on the round so it's kind of like powering up uh, the GM. Wish tokens represent the game's uh, resource management. You can use wish tokens as I just did to upgrade your offensive dice or upgrade your search or anytime you're rolling a die and you're using it in a proactive way, you can use your wishes. Uh, and you are, have a maximum of three per turn. You're going to be getting one each turn and there are ways to get wishes. So the game is very much about getting wishes, using wishes, getting, losing, getting, losing. That's kind of the resource uh, flow of the game. The other thing that you could do with wish tokens is on the GM turn, the first thing that the GM is going to do is activate monsters. They're going to attack and you can use wish tokens to block incoming damage. Anytime a Goonie uh, takes damage, that's bad, but if they take their health in damage uh, and get reduced to zero hit points, then that's even worse. Uh, it's not the end of the game. Uh, there is a condition where you will wipe the damage and keep on going. But I will show you the good thing that the GM gets when they're able to take a Goonie down in just a minute. The players are done. They've all used uh, both of their actions and it is time for the GM to go. The GM is going to be sitting here grinning and cackling and plotting behind this really snazzy looking DM screen. Very, very uh, <laughs> old school Appendix N type thing that has basically everything that you would need in order to uh, run the game, answer players' questions. But I think this game does a good job of making the Goondock Master a little bit more than a facilitator. Is an actual opponent. You have the resources to be able to you know, really fight back against the players and uh, beat them down. So uh, no problem. If you win, <laughs> go for the win. Be evil. Uh, you will be able to progress in the campaign anyway. Uh, if you choose to play the campaign, the campaign has simple rules to kind of keep things going. All right, so in terms of the GM round, the first thing they're going to do is going to activate the monsters and attack. Those are very simple. They roll the dice and they can use upgrades, upgrade their dice just as players can, only they use these skulls. The skulls, as I showed you, they, they can come from the player's rolls. The more they roll, the more you have, and you can have as many of the skulls as you want. So if the players get a little bit froggy and they roll a lot, they give you a lot of skulls, you're in good shape. You have more fun times to offer in terms of your GM deck. You're going to have a hand of cards. Uh, and there's a lot of options in terms of the cards. So as you see, uh, there are extra cards, and uh, there are different ones that are available for different missions. So then three and eight, and uh, so you see that there's a lot of variety in what the GM is going to do, and it's going to be uh, very tailored to each scenario. But this is a basic uh, hand of cards, and you're going to play, you're going to be able to draw a card and play a card for free uh, every single turn. So then you look at what you have. Let's say I wanted to play Disruptive Momentum, uh, Dreadful Momentum, I would uh, discard that and draw three cards. <laughs> Just in case I want some more options. You can use the skull tokens. Uh, so if you have a lot of them, you can uh, play extra cards and also draw extra cards. So if you really have a lot of cards, you have a lot of flexibility in what you can do. Uh, be careful though, because you can't play more than one named card in a round. So then I could not play two dreadful momentums for lots of cards. Otherwise my turn would take a long time. <laughs> Uh, an example of an offensive card, Abrupt cave -in, place three rubble tokens on any passage, kind of harrying uh, the passage of the Goonies, and there's all sorts of effects like that. 
In addition, you'll notice that many of the cards have a react function. These do not cost a skull. In this example, after a Goonie moves through a passage, place a rubble token on that passage. Uh, you can react to the Goonies as they're going, so it gives you a, a reason to pay attention to what the Goonies doing on their turn. In this particular case, you can kind of separate Goonies. Goonies are more powerful when they're together, weaker when they're apart. So a lot of the cards uh, work on separating Goonies, wearing them down, getting rid of their wish tokens, uh, etc. And this is the star of the show. If you are the GM, this is the Hourglass, uh, which represents uh, your ability to kind of fast forward the end game. Uh, what happens is as you do bad things to the characters, including reduce them to zero health, I mentioned before that Goonies do not die, never say die, when they reach zero health. However, a more precious resource is wasted, which is time. So uh, this is super cool in terms of the product uh, stuff, but then every time a Goonie dies, you're going to fill the hourglass. If you're able to, you, to do two, three, and four uh, in terms of filling the hourglass and you start the turn with the, the hourglass is empty, at least on the top, then you will win. That is what the GM is going for. Another way that they can make that happen is with these cards. Uh, anything with an hourglass will be able to proc uh, what they call an end is nigh roll. So sometimes there'll be some there'll be some game conditions that will let you do it for free. So that's a, a goal that you can have, try to get the game condition. Uh, you know, so so this in this case, uh, Goonie has no wish tokens, so you might want to do things to spend their wish tokens in order to say, ha ha, I'm going to do my uh, end is nigh roll. Or if you have a ton of GM tokens, just you know, spend two of them and get that going. You will take uh, three simple dice, but if you have the skull tokens, you can upgrade them. And if you're a pro, you can upgrade them all the way up to the best rolls. And if you roll and get two successes, then you are able to move that. This is a terrible, right here, uh, I just rolled something terrible. <laughs> One success, I didn't move anything, but at least I got a uh, skull to get for the next time that I want to do that. And so that is a full round. As play proceeds, the Goonies are going to be traveling to and from the different rooms, depending on the map that is laid out for the particular scenario. There are shaky bridges. There are secret passages to be found, uh, depending on what the scenario says are the secret passages uh, and the way to proc them. There are rubble that you can find. There's different piles of treasure. There are also different tiles that you can uh, use uh, to make the board different depending on the scenario. So then uh, different scenarios are gonna have different tiles. Uh, there is a lot of space uh, in the design in this one board to have very, very different styles of adventures. I can honestly say, having played all nine scenarios, that each scenario does feel uh, markedly different from the previous one. Not so much in terms of what the Goonies do, because the Goonies are pretty stable in what they do, but in terms of how the board operates and what you can discover that uh, there's a ton of new adventures waiting for you in Goonies, never say die. So that was Goonies at the table, thematically, home run. <laughs> this game uh, was so lovingly crafted for someone like me who was young when the movie came out, uh, watched it uh, plenty of times on the big screen and then on the VHS tape over and over and over again, watching the Goonies. Uh, hadn't seen it in many, many years, but playing this game, all the old stuff came up again, different scenes, different scenarios, uh, and... It had the best of both worlds in the sense that there was a lot of fidelity to the original movies, especially in the first couple scenarios. But then it kind of branches off into really fanfic, officially licensed fanfic. I did ask the designer about that. Uh, but, you know, um, and, you know, the fact that it is officially licensed is important because it was definitely kept within the spirit of the Goonies, you know, and the One-Eyed Willie and, you know, the Fratellis, that they really deepened that lore in terms of the future stories. They did a good job. You know, I played all nine scenarios and it definitely had its momentum story-wise. I really enjoyed it. So the, the big question with a game like this is, do you need to have that love of the original source material in order to enjoy this game? I really think that of people could get the, the idea without knowing anything about the Goonies. At the end of the day, it is a uh, one-verse-many dungeon game. 
we have plenty of those. You know, Hero Quest is a thing that people played. Uh, did you need to be uh, have fidelity to like the barbarian or whatever else was in that game to enjoy it? Not at all. Uh, this is that kind of thing, and I can definitely imagine because of where it is on the weight scale. It's a little bit above a mass market game, but it's a little bit below, you know, something mid-weight that we might uh, be used to as hobby gamers. It kind of hits that frequency really, really well. So I can imagine, say, uh, the kids in Stranger Things, first season, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13, playing, you know, a game like this in their basement and, you know, making spooky voices and having a good time without knowing the Goonies. I think this game has enough. And I can't say because I'm, I already have them, I have it in there, the Goonies, the people I played with, same, <laughs> my age. But just trying to extrapolate, there's enough in here to just have an engaging story, have an engaging uh, dungeon-filled time thematically. So just home run all around on that end. Mechanically, this game knows what it is. It is a straight-up dungeon crawl, and it is dice, dice, dice. Nothing gets resolved. Uh, moving barely gets resolved. Sometimes even your movement has to get resolved with dice if you're crossing one of those bridges. So... You can have games, and there's a lot of modern games that do this, where you can't really fail. Uh, you know, either you get the success or you get some sort of, like, uh, you know, backup plan in case, you know, you roll suboptimal. You get, like, a resource for use later, that kind of thing. Here, eh -eh. <laughs> you fail, you fail. And... There's a lot of resources in order to mitigate stuff. You can use your tokens, whether it's the wish tokens if you're players or you're the, the skull tokens if you're the GM. You can use those to upgrade those dice, increase your chances. They only need one chance. But I have seen plenty of times where you've just poured lots of resources into a roll, even like a big roll. Like if the GM is making that hourglass roll and they only have to make that four times. So it's huge stakes. All the resources in there. <clears throat> Game doesn't really apologize for that. It's going for that old school, exciting uh, sensibility. And it is exciting when you hit it. And it is deflating when you don't hit it. I wanted to flag that because not everyone is into that in terms of modern sensibility for gaming. It's more of an old school feel. I remember that from when I was a kid. I played games like that uh, growing up. So that it didn't matter to me so much. But I did want to flag that for folks. Another thing to flag in terms of this adventure style game is that there's no character progression. It would be weird, right, to have the kids kind of like level up. Now I'm level three chunk or, you know, I get the flaming sword of whatever. You're still, you know, the hard scrabble kids that are, you know, uh, doing their thing, uh, especially going, going into scenario seven, eight, nine. You're there for the story. You're there to explore the different mechanisms. You're there to explore what happens, what the board does with those uh, tiles and how it morphs. And there's different meta rules. You know, sometimes you'll have, uh, you know, scenarios where it's like you just kind of go from place to place to place. Uh, won't uh, spoil what's happening, but it's the geometry of the board really changes depending on what is happening with the scenario rules. But the player side is pretty static. You're playing the Goonies. And there are people who are out there who want that uh, sense of progression when it comes to their dungeon experience. That's not here. You're here for the story. So I wanted to put a flag out there uh, for the folks like that. Another flag, one versus many. We haven't gotten a lot of those recently. So many uh, one versus many games are constructed to where the one is a facilitator. And it's the many that are having a good time. And the one is like the facilitator of fun. Here you go. Have this, have this, have this. And they don't, they're not really playing. I think this game does a decent job, as I said, in an overview of giving you enough resources to feel like you can go after the the, the Goonies. I think the game is weighted towards the Goonies winning. <laughs> Didn't it's um, especially when the Goonies are smart and they kind of stick together. Uh, the Goonies are much more powerful. I didn't say this in an overview, but they can share dice and you know kind of interact together uh, if they stay. Um, so the GM is going to try to separate them as much as possible, and then also you know have other things that they're playing. I felt like the GM was kind of at a disadvantage, but at least I had a couple of wins when I was a GM, and that felt really cool. And it's pretty simple, you know, to kind of get to the next scenario. There's a little, you just read a little bit of the book and move on. So that felt pretty good in terms of a one versus many game elates my fears there. I clearly enjoy this game. <laughs> my one big thing, and this is for me, um, because it's dicey, it felt a little bit long at times 
I'm not a person that plays, you know, like two hour games, two and a half hour games, especially these dicey games. Uh, I really felt like a, a lot of the missed rolls, while they theoretically could generate excitement when you actually hit them, when you're having a, a cascade of misses or you know if something's not working out, then it just adds time and adds kind of a little bit of fat uh, that doesn't need to be there in the experience. I mean, the the a longer adventure could take an hour and a half, two hours, and if it's, if in this type of game. You know, I want to be able to kind of, you know, breeze through, fly through, uh, have things happen. You know, failure maybe could cause something to happen, but not really here. It's just failure. It's just kind of this open, this open and a uh, close ended thing. Uh, you know, survive the monsters and try to do the thing again that you were trying to do. So in terms of time, there was a little bit of bloat in the system, I felt. Um, but that that's, you know, that's kind of my biggest thing about it. Everything else, uh, I really enjoyed. So this is an easy seal of approval for me, a 7.5 out of 10. Uh, I'm I'm in for nine scenarios. The expansion has more scenarios. I'm, I'm going to look for that whenever I, that comes along. When I want to buy an expansion for a game, you know that I enjoy it. And this is going to be a part of my collection for a little while. Do you need to be a Goonies fan? I don't think so. I think it would help a lot. <laughs> if you're a Goonies fan and you like these dungeon crawls, this really is a no-brainer. I actually didn't mention the price. It's 30 bucks in Target. You might even get it for cheaper if you want to trade for it or something. Uh, you know, that plays into the rating as well. I'm not going to, you know, I'll lie about that. I mean, just having so much game uh, and the game knowing what it is for that much, uh, for that lower price, that as available as it is, there's so many things to like about Goonies Never Say Die. This is Jason reminding you, if you can change your mind, you can change the world. So until next time, hey, everybody. Yeah.